Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sherwin. I'm the lead specialist nurse in endocrinology here at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. We'd like to welcome you all to Birmingham and to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And we're very delighted that you've um, chosen Birmingham for this first acromegaly meeting. And we're also delighted to take part in this uh, particular meeting. Um, we have the group of the, uh, from the Futurity Service, which I'll, I'll let uh, Mr. Amit introduce later on because it's part of his presentation. But we're very, very um, proud, of, uh, especially for the uh, uh, Futurity Foundation and this group organizing this meeting. I was just in the um, advisory board for uh, pituitary last, uh, nurse advisory board last week, and I met a representative from WAPO. I don't know whether you met WAPO, you're aware of WAPO is a World Alliance of Pituitary Organization, mm -hmm. and the main remit is really to support patient organization like you in pituitary. And when I mentioned about your first acromegaly meeting, uh, they're not aware of this one, because there are resources available for you in terms of support. Um, in terms, particularly in terms of gathering like this. So uh, I will um, forward that contact details to Dan and to Steve for future meetings if you're planning to actually extend this one. So on behalf of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital team, you will meet the rest of the team later on. We have our clinical lead in pituitary service and we have our um, um, CNS, the clinical nurse specialist lead as well, who will be taking part. We'll all be here this afternoon during the Q&A session. So we welcome you and I hope you have a great meeting. So it's my pleasure to introduce the very first speaker, who is an ENT consultant, and is also part of our Pituitary Multidisciplinary Team, Mr. Shah Samet. So, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm not going to do a song and a dance, despite what uh, Nikki wanted me to do. So, uh, I'm... Uh, I'm an ENT consultant and I do pituitary surgery and I, I know at least a third of you. Um, this presentation is uh, on behalf of the team because surgery is not just uh, the, 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 the main part of the treatment, it's a small part of uh, the whole journey. And within our Birmingham pituitary team we've got the surgeons, we've got uh, uh, endocrinologists, CNS nurses, neuro-ophthalmology, radiology, we've got a whole team because pituitary hormone dysfunction uh, affects all of the organs and uh, it's important that then we get together to try and address all of, uh, all of those things. So um, uh, I will talk for the next 20 minutes, half an hour or so, on the surgical aspects, but if there's anywhere where you want me to stop, do uh, do just uh, stop me and I, I, I'll go through it again. Can we have the lights down a little bit at the front? So, um, I was taught uh, pituitary surgery by uh, Alan Johnson. This is uh, Alan. Um, who, who knows uh, or knew Alan? So, uh, Alan's now running a 160-acre farm. Uh, is busier than he was as a pituitary surgeon. He, um, so he's really busy and, and I still see him regularly. So he taught me pituitary surgery and he, he retired in 2011. So the role of the surgeon is not just the surgery, but it's to be part of the team to um, start from before the surgery. So it's important you meet the surgeon beforehand so that um, as a team we can confirm, confirm the need for surgery um, which is either for visual or potential visual problems or hormone disturbance. We then need to assess fitness for surgery and anesthesias become more and more safe as the years have gone on and there are not many occasions where um, uh, with current methods of uh, making surgery safe where uh, anesthet a general anaesthetic would be a complete contraindication. Um, we would go through the consent and consent is a process. It's not just signing a form. It's a process that involves the whole team so that we can tell you what to expect and uh, allow you time to absorb that and, and ask questions. And as part of that process, 
uh, often our CNS nurses take a, a key role as well in giving you information that you can take away and uh, and read and then having an opportunity to ask questions not only of me uh, but of uh, the rest of the team uh, and then the surgery and the post-operative um, uh, management. It's an evolving technique and a um, hundred, hundred years ago we were doing craniotomies so uh, patients were having a bone flap removed and then we were approaching the pituitary gland from uh, a transcranial route and then as techniques evolved we've moved to going through the ethmoid sinuses, the antrum, and then the transnasal technique, which is a natural corridor because the pituitary gland is at the skull base and often herniates into the sphenoid sinus, which is an air-filled sinus in the back of the nose. Um, the first four uh, here were all using a microscope so we weren't getting a whole microscope and fitting it in the nose but we were uh, angling the uh, light and the visual pathways to get down in a cone uh, down into our target area but for the past 15 uh, years or so, we've been using endoscopes and telescopes, and that allows us to get right down within a few millimeters of where the pathology is, the area that we want to operate on, which is, allows us to look around corners and to get very close and to magnify uh, the areas that we want to see and, uh, and operate on. So with the endoscopic technique using telescopes and endoscopes, um, it's a bit like operating with chopsticks. So I can't get my hands in through the nostrils into the skull base, although I do try. And I've got really small hands. Um, it's always two surgeons. So it's, it's a surgeon holding the endoscope and we call that surgeon he, who's driving. So he's driving the endoscope because he or she will show me where to operate and where not to and what to avoid. And it's four hands and two nostrils and four feet. So if you ever see um, one of these cases and uh, there's um, four foot pedals, there is a hundred instruments and there's three or four screens and there's lots going on and we operate through both nostrils but even the endoscopic technique is evolving and uh, we we operate through both nostrils with sometimes four instruments in a nostril and this is a this is a child so even with uh, with small nostrils the soft tissues will slowly expand and allow the instruments and the space um, in line with the advances in technology with t television, so going from uh, uh, just a standard definition colour TV to high definition has been a really big jump in uh, allowing um, uh, us as surgeons to, to be able to see much finer detail and higher resolution. But we're currently moving to 4K, so ultra HD. So it's it's moving with what we're seeing in our terrestrial uh, uh, television sets, and and 3D is coming in as well. So we will, for some cases, be wearing 3D specs and looking at a large screen with the um, operating field coming out as in 3D uh, a 3D movie. Um, so, beginning of surgery, the, the lining of the nose is uh, quite vascular, so I would usually start off and I would decongest the nose and I, I put in neuropathies in the nose very carefully to reduce the bleeding and it allows me space. 
and this is one of our theatre scrub nurses and he's demonstrating that in fact I'm using gravity to help reduce bleeding so that his head is uh, above the level of his heart and so we're using simple things to uh, help the case and this is what I was trying to to demonstrate so we've got four screens here and we do the surgery with image guidance with navigation and that's not because we don't know where to go but it's because what we want to do is to make the surgery as safe as possible so before we uh, open and remove a, a, a bony wall we want to know what's behind it we want to be precise and the more information we have the more precise we can be so we can then remove the bone safely over a carotid artery or uh, over the junction of the roof of the, the sinus um, and uh, in allowing us to carefully do that we're able then to carry out more extensive surgery safely so sometimes it's described as minimal access surgery but it's not this is maximal because we're getting into the back of the nose with a divergent so the endoscope allows us to look out by at least 40 degrees whereas before with the microscope we were looking down and it was getting smaller and smaller but with the endoscope it's allowed maximal surgery and we're able to look around a corner look behind a vessel or behind a nerve to try and find uh, functioning adenomas that um, uh, we can try and then remove um, uh, safely this is uh, an example of of both a micro adenoma and a macro so these two uh, scans here show show the uh, center of the head and these are both MRI scans and in both patients there's a right sided so when we look at a scan the right side is on the left and the left is on the right so this is a right sided micro adenoma because it's less than a centimeter and this here is also a right-sided macroadenoma because it's more than a centimeter. And in both patients, what we want to do is identify where the carotid artery is. We look at the septations the, of the uh, sinuses to understand the anatomy, and we use our image guidance to try and help to identify those areas <coughs> so that we can try and make surgery safe. When you're coming up to surgery, um, you'll often have multiple scans, uh, not just uh, scans for the tumour, but you'll have a navigation scan, and sometimes that's a CT scan, sometimes it's an MRI scan. And just like sat-nav in a car, so sat-nav needs uh, a map of the, the roads and, and the area, well, our navigation system, which is linked in to the x-ray needs a scan either a CT or an MRI that then gives us that road map of where all those critical um, uh, structures uh, are. This is what I see. So this is what I want to see and this is for me why surgery is so fun and I enjoy it because when I get into the back of the nose I can uh, remove partitions, I can identify structures and holes, and I know exactly what is above, what is below. Um, I do it uh, under uh, as much control as I can, and that then allows me to safely shave away little areas uh, to uh, allow me then to progress to uh, removing the areas uh, that I want to. Um, I don't know whether I should have put a, you know, like a certificate on these uh, videos. But... Warning before lunch. Warning before lunch. Yeah. So this here 
is a demonstration showing that we can, with an angled scope, so to look around, to get behind, this is a carotid artery, and what I'd want to do is safely with um, uh, a magnified view. So this area is only a centimetre, but with uh, new technology um, and uh, just, you know, who's, who's, what, what size screen do you have at home? Who's got a 60-inch or a 55-inch telly? Yeah, so a lot of us, so in theatre, so have we. So I will sometimes operate on a 55-inch screen, which allows me to have a one-centimetre space magnified so that I can then look really, really carefully at structures, try and identify the difference between what's normal and what might not be normal. So it's magnified. So all of this technology is really helpful. And it's what's allowed us to try and advance um, uh, surgical uh, care and surgical results. So that there, that's a, a Doppler. So again, what I'm doing is in this, in this, um, in this, Oh, it's not stopping. So in this patient, what I was doing was I was using a Doppler, which is an ultrasound, during the operation to confirm where I was so that I can work around a structure that five years ago we wouldn't have because these Dopplers weren't available that could get into the back of the nose. So there's a lot of advances in technology that has meant what was possible, what, what wasn't possible five years ago is more possible now. Um, I don't know if this is projecting, but this is, this is what the end of an operation might look like. So it's an empty cavity and we've tried to preserve the normal gland um, uh, behind and the roof, the separation between the roof of where the pituitary gland sits and, and the brain is only a few cells thick. And that's called um, an arachnoid layer. And sometimes just stretching it makes some of the fluid that bathes the brain come through, and that's CSF. And when we get that, then we repair it. And again, not only has the technology changed, but some of the techniques that we're using now weren't around five years ago, ten years ago. So this is a, the lining of the nose, and it's called a nasoceptal flap. And whereas before we were always just taking fat or muscle from the leg, sometimes where it's appropriate, we will rotate tissue from within the nose to try and close holes and to try and give uh, less morbidity either in the leg or the nose. And we've shown that it works very effectively. Um, sometimes there's... Uh, I'm going to take that out. Is that it? So sometimes um, post-operatively there can be an even maybe when you get home, if there's fluid dripping from the nose, that's a CSF leak. And then we would um, uh, get you back into theatre and um, fashion various uh, tissue flaps from the nose to, uh, to repair them. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about technology. So um, I'm a rhinologist, so I do noses and anything in the sinus, the skull base, and it's very gadget heavy. So uh, there's lots of new technology, and this is uh, an angle scope that has, it's like a periscope, so one is able to get into the, uh, the area and actually look around, whereas what we were doing before was we would have two or three different endoscopes 
now with newer technology, we're able to use uh, the same endoscope. 3D. Um, so in 2014, we were the first in Europe to use 3D surgery, and that was a, a pituitary patient. Um, there's been advances in 3D. This is 3D again, and um, whereas back in 2014, the 3D endoscopes were standard definition, now, this year, they're in uh, high uh, definition. And it's double, because if we had a silver screen and you were all wearing glasses, then it would be uh, uh, 3D. And what, what we're doing is, this is a patient with a pituitary uh, tumour, is we're able to look around a corner at the top. This is a carotid artery, so we're able to work around these structures and in 3D it gives us that depth perception to be able to uh, reach those areas. Um, at the end of the operation, unlike having um, an external operation where at the end we would put stitches in to close, we can't stitch up the nose on the inside. So we use um, different materials to uh, help to reduce bleeding and to help the area to heal. So this is definitely a change. So maybe if anyone had uh, surgery 10 years ago, who remembers having nasal packs taken out? Yeah. So it's the one thing for patients who've had surgery a while ago and they've had yards and yards of pack taken out. It really is uncomfortable to say the least. So the majority of our patients now we're using nasopore which is a seaweed based hemostatic so it stops bleeding dressing and we're able to add some steroid to it sometimes which helps it to heal but essentially this absorbable pack doesn't need to be removed. It is there and within a couple of weeks it turns into jelly and if you start using a nasal douche a nasal wash then it will um, it will uh, dissolve away so most patients now will have absorbable nasal packs sometimes we do still use nasal other nasal packs that have to be removed <coughs> especially if there's a CSF leak um, Patients generally are in hospital between three and five days. A small number of patients um, go home at two days, but I would say the majority between three and five days. Um, nasal crusting. Who remembers nasal crusting? So how do, you, how do you get rid of it? So you can either come to clinic, and sometimes I will pick it out, but that's often traumatic, it's uncomfortable and it can cause bleeding. So um, the best way to treat that is after about 10 days of having <coughs> surgery, we can use a nasal douche. And uh, a nasal douche is a wash. It's a saline uh, uh, solution. It's an isotonic solution which allows uh, patients to gently wash the crusting out. It washes the packs out and then it speeds up that time to get the sense of smell returning. Um, uh, I've, I've got some information leaflets on nasal douching because I'm always asked about it, so I'll leave that at the front. Um, but nasal douching, again, has revolutionized our ability to use lots of absorbable packs, and then a week or two later, when we start uh, to wash the nose out, the packs start to dissolve and the nose starts to clear and the crust disappears. It is a whole team approach. And again, I'm going to put this slide to say that before surgery and during the surgery and after the surgery, it isn't only the surgeon, it is the whole team. Whilst you're on the ward afterwards, You'll see uh, one of um, the uh, CMS nurses in, endo in uh, endocrinology. Uh, you may see 
the endocrinology team, the endocrinology doctors, we've seen surgeons, uh, we have a dedicated anaesthetists, and um, we are able as a team to offer you that whole uh, whole service. Um, thank you very much. Any anything anyone wants to ask about surgery? Um, I've got still some time, I think, about any aspect at all. Put me on the spot. Can, can I just ask, as yes. a show of hands, how many people have a CSF leak? Okay. In your experience, why? I think, why do CSF leaks happen? So, um, um, <coughs> I look at the, if we look at the scans, I'm going to go back and put those two pictures up, or we could put this one up actually. So, um, if I am trying to gently peel off the adenoma and we try and do an extra capsular dissection so that we have the highest chance possible of trying to get the hormone levels into remission. So it's a balance between being radical but safe. So if I peel off a tumour from uh, a very, very thin layer between the cavity of where the gland sits and the brain, which is filled with that cavity with CSF, then uh, I will get an intraoperative CSF. Um, and what, uh, what determines um, rates of post-operative leak is sometimes it's um, whether there's any factors that mean that patients might have a higher pressure. So then, uh, and, and the different ways of repairing it. So we now you are using... Uh, multiple layers, we're using newer and newer techniques, we're using lots of different graph materials, so uh, there's uh, durogen replacements that um, uh, go between bone and dura, between the dura and the brain, and vascularize, so tissue from the nose. Um, why, do, why do some patients get CSF leaks and some don't? Well, that's the nature of surgery, in that what we try and do is we try and give the highest chance in the safest possible way of achieving remission. And for some tumours, it's not possible because the tumour is in areas where if we were to be too radical, then the potential risks that we're putting you through are unacceptable. So the risk of a carotid injury is extremely low. But if it happens, it's 100%. It potentially could lead to a stroke. It could lead to worse than that. And those are some of the factors and, and the experience that we have that determine and where the tumour is that will determine um, when, uh, wh where, where, we, uh, where, we, where we go and how radical we try and be. So, um, oh, here. So, so, if we look at these two scans, then um, on the picture on the right, um, I will always look at the scan and I'll try and identify where's the normal gland. And here in this scan, I can see normal gland and I can see where the, where the adenoma is. And I know for me as the surgeon, the highest risk area for me to get the CSF leak is here because the gland is protecting, the black is CSF, the gland's protecting that area. So when I'm operating, I will always do that area last. So I, I clear the sides, I clear the floors, and then 
the area where I think is is at greatish risk, I do last because I want to try and have the best chance of achieving cure or remission. Um, but the nature of the cells in that area, it, it, it is only a few cells thick. And sometimes in, in removing that and the radicality and the balance between getting that is uh, results in a CSF leak. For me, as the surgeon, I don't think a CSF leak is a major complication. And in a controlled manner, if I can get someone in remission and have a CSF leak that's managed, then long term, that's probably better. And it's a balance between, you know, making sure that I can achieve that. Or am I really cautious and I have a very low remission rate, so most of my patients then still need medical treatment, but I don't have many CSF leaks. And that's where, as a team, I, I, you know, I, I invite my endocrinologist to come to theatre and sort of help me to decide how radical I need to be because they are going to manage the medical management for the rest of your lives. And that's where working in a team is really important. So they will come to me and they will say, really important, you know, you, you've got to get this and, it, and it's, and it's on, on the right side and, and we think you need to be quite radical here and maybe take a very thin sliver of what you think might be normal because we know that there's a, a very, very good chance of cure here because it's a small tumour and it's discreet and I can see it. Whereas sometimes if we've got tumours that are, that are bigger and not in this case, but that are going into the cavernous sinus and are going behind the carotid artery, then actually statistically we know that the chance of getting remission is very low, but if we can reduce the uh, the drive of the acromegaly significantly, then the medical treatment is much easier and much more effective. So it's always a combination uh, of uh, the balance between radicality and the risks. Okay, brilliant. Are, are there, we've got a couple more minutes left. There's are there any more questions? questions? Yeah. What, what exactly do you class as cure? Because, you know, people talk about... Near Remission. Near yeah. yeah. But, I mean, is, does that mean that there's, you don't need uh, like different hormones for life? Uh, does that mean you don't need anything? It surgery's done, and you should, apart from what's long-term effects in your body, uh, everything's uh, works on its own without. So, for uh, acromegaly, mm -hmm. it, it would be that uh, you your IGF one levels are within the normal range and you don't need any medical treatment. But um, I would reserve uh, that question to be answered by John and Nikki later. Yeah. You were saying that some of the larger tumours go off behind the um the carotid artery into into the other cavernous sciences. Yes. And my tumour is like that. I had residual tumour and then again maybe do you see a future in, in te the technology of surgery um, to be able to look at those tumours in the future as technology improves? So people like myself might end up with a sur surgical cure at some point in the future as opposed to um, medication, medication, all, all their lives. Because I suffer a lot, so I've had a lot of um, some of my med medication now purely because of the side effects. I'm having to have I see advancements, mm -hmm. but I think we've got to be realistic mm -hmm. in, in saying that, well, actually, everything's surgically possible, but at what risk? Yeah. So there are... Uh, very fine nerves that run 
within that area and it's not only a CSF leak and injury to the carotid artery but it, within the cavernous sinus there are nerves that control the eyes and uh, if I am if as the surgeon I'm, I'm too radical within the cavernous sinus, I can affect those nerves as well. However, I, I do think technology is helping us and, you know, it's helping you. And, you know, I, I showed you a video of a, a Doppler, so and it's an ultrasound that within um, uh, the case I, I can get out, it's sterile, and I can mark out where these structures are with an angled divergent endoscope. I can look behind and look around. And that's enabled us to safely try and achieve greater resections. But there will be tumors that will always be in areas that are not resectable without significant risk. And sometimes we will be in all the patients are discussed with the whole team beforehand and we, we try and gauge what we think is the likelihood of cure and for some we, we know that we're not going to achieve remission but what we want to try and do is to remove as much as we safely can so that the amount of medication that you need to control what's left is reduced, and that's still a good result. Hi. Hi, you, you, you're talking about removing the dimmers. It's a soft tumor. Are you, as advanced, when talking about calcified tumors? So, 85-ish percent of pituitary tumors are soft, right. um, and uh, by their nature are um, uh, easier to remove because they're soft and we can gently remove them with with uh, curatage and suction. 10 to 15 percent are firm and rubbery and in those tumours it's it's much harder because we are having to work around normal structures to uh, remove them Whereas with the soft tumours, we can work within the tumour and remove it from inside out. Whereas with the firm rubbery tumours, they are a challenge. However, with the increase in the resolution of, uh, and of our endoscopes, so we can now see in much greater t detail with greater magnification. So we can recognise the edge of what we think is normal and what's not. And then we can try and dissect that and try and cut it out. Um, for very firm tumours, then we use other technology. Um, uh, there's technology that has an ultrasound wave that shakes the cells and breaks them. So, so that there's, there's other technology that's there. Last question, I think, so I'm very conscious you have lunch. Okay. Go on, Okay. What do you say? Visual. Oh, right, sorry. Oh, sorry, no. okay. oh me. Um, what would you say is the biggest difference, apart from the obvious, of like, um, with craniotomies and transfer nidal? Because I had two of the craniotomy. And... Yeah. So, despite it being one of the very early ways of treating pituitary tumours, very occasionally, even now, we still have to resort to craniotomy, but it's very uncommon, and it's uncommon because with our endoscopes and with our angled endoscope, we're able to get around and look around corners and work around vessels and, 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 and nerves. Um, but sometimes if a tumor has a very large extension that's really out into the brain, then it makes no sense going through the nose. The uh, advantage of having a, an operation through the nose is that most of the time it doesn't involve any brain retraction. 
So we're not pushing the brain out of the way to get to the tumour. Mm -hmm. Whereas if one has a craniotomy, mm -hmm. we're having to find a and create a tunnel, a pathway, which means gently lifting the brain up and out of the way to get access uh, deeper in. Um, uh, younger adults and children seem to cope with that without much difficulty, but as we get older and older, then the brain doesn't like being squashed. <laughs> and so there is measurable um, uh, morbidity with uh, loss of cognition and things. Thank you. Last, last question, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. On average, how long before people can breathe through their nose and smell and taste again after surgery? Probably three months. However, um, it depends. So if I have someone that even after three months of struggling, I would bring them, I'm an ENT surgeon, I bring them to my nose clinic. I've got a nose clinic. And I look up the nose in outpatients with an endoscope often with the screen so that I'm looking and the patient's looking as well. And we look together and look at the where the olfactory cleft, where the nerves come down. And what we're looking for is, is there still scabbing and crusting that's there? And what can we do to try and help you to get rid of that, to try and help it? Brilliant. Well, that's been fascinating, I think you'll all agree. So can we say a big thank you?